Good afternoon, everybody uneducated economist here. So how do you know when the best time to invest is? How do you know when you take your money and you're putting it towards a particular investment that you know that this is the best timing for it? That we are at the bottom and that from here on out, it should be a continual path upward. How do you know when to invest? You buy when there's blood in the streets. When people are fearful, you become greedy. And when people are greedy, you become fearful. But you buy when there's blood in the streets. When everybody is crying that they have lost everything. When corporations are saying that they don't know if they're going to be able to exist any longer. When you have people who are getting laid off and losing their pensions and losing their homes and losing everything that they had. That's when you buy. You buy when there's blood in the streets. So now I'm looking at articles coming out of coming out of Russia talking about the economy and the economic turmoil that's taken place from them invading into Ukraine and the fallout from some of the uh, sanctions that are taking place. You have bondholders foreign bondholders of Russian sovereign debt who are not getting paid their coupon. The coupon is the interest rate that the bondholder gets paid for holding on to the sovereign debt. So ultimately, it's a loan to Russia. And Russia saying, hey, if you're outside of our country, you're not getting our payment. You're not getting the payment on it. Well, that puts the value of those bonds pretty low. If you can't get the coupon payment and you can't cash it in, it's pretty much worthless. This is something that we have talked about many times. Third party claims. This is why you have to have a lot of gold and silver on hand so that you can avoid the regulations and rules and seizing of assets, the denial of payments. All this stuff is third party. When you hold on to gold and silver, you're outside of that third party. But right now, these Russian bonds, the sovereign debt and the corporate debt, they're in some bad position right now. I mean, if you can't do business with your bond, like whether sell it, get the coupon rate off of it, if it becomes just essentially a worthless piece of paper to you, then what's the point? What's the point of even holding on to it? You might as well sell it for whatever little you can get for it because it's not doing anything for you. These corporations, they're in the same position when it comes to rolling their old debt over into new debt. If they need to borrow money right now, it's very difficult to try and sell your bonds because foreign investment is saying, hey, we're not interested. I mean, your sovereign debt won't even pay. What's the chances that a corporate debt is going to pay? So no, we're not buying your bonds. So what ends up happening? Well, the bond prices end up falling and the yields begin to rise as they are trying to attract an investor. But who do they find? The usual suspects. Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. See, these guys are investing in to the Russian corporate debt. See, they see the blood in the streets. They know that these bonds are probably about as cheap as they're going to get. Could they go to zero? Sure. Could they default? Absolutely they could. But could they also be at the bottom? Well, these guys are buying in. Makes you wonder what's happening here. So here you have sanctions being put on Russia saying, hey, we're trying to hurt you economically to prevent you from doing more harm in the Ukraine. We're putting these economic sanctions on you. But yet here, the big banks are going around that saying, hey, we'll, we'll buy your bonds. You know, yeah, you're a Russian company who's, you know, being put into the same position as far as the government goes with these sanctions. But we don't really care because that's a good buying opportunity happening right there. And even if it does benefit the Russian corporations who may even in turn be helping out the war effort in Ukraine... This is just kind of the way the big banks work. We buy when there's blood in the streets. 
So it's pretty interesting times to keep watching this. I mean, there's positions right now for people that they cannot get out of, right? They have purchased into Russian stocks, Russian debt, Russian investments that they can't get out of. But yet here's the big banks moving in. You know, it's pretty interesting times to think about it. And on top of that, go and look at some of the trade that is now starting to occur. There's a pretty interesting article that uh, I will leave a link down in the description for you guys too. And this is how uh, I believe it was aluminum that typically would be imported into China. These It was imports going into China, but because it didn't actually make it beyond... I forget, it's just like, because it didn't make it beyond like a, a certain point as far as the distribution line, they can actually export this stuff back out without the tariffs attached to it. And so all of a sudden, here's these imports that would typically be consumed by China, having such a profit behind it that it's now moving out of China and into Europe, because Europe is no longer purchasing this aluminum from Russia. See how these trades start to change? I mean, once you have severed a supply chain relationship, it becomes very difficult to try and reestablish that again. Something that actually happened here with our forestry products. During the initial trade wars that started kicking in, the United States told Canada, hey, we are going to put a huge tariff on your softwood imports. Almost at the exact same time, China was telling the United States, we're going to put a huge tariff on all the logs that are shipping into the into China, coming from the United States to China. That put a huge damper on the log exports coming from the United States, and it reestablished a new partnership with China and Russia, and Russia has become the major exporter of forestry products to China, when it used to be Canada and the United States. And I believe, like, Russia was always a big exporter of, of forestry products to them. But that trade war really severed a lot of that relationship, and now it's been reestablished more from Russia to China. Well, these things start to happen. Every time there's conflict, wars, currency wars, trade wars, when these supply chains get severed, reestablishing them, reestablishing them is not only expensive, but it also is essentially unreversible as once those new partnerships have been established, they really maintain that same position going into the future just to try and maintain that stability. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Bunch of links down in the description for you guys. Uneducated economist, you let me know.